So uh, quick history on the company. Um, we're about four years old, started in Brooklyn, still in Brooklyn. We have uh, about 25 employees. Uh, we're in the Gowanus area, 3rd Street and 3rd Avenue. Um, it's a nice cheap place. It's close to trains and it uh, turns out most of our employees already lived within like a 15 minute walk so it's kind of an easy place to keep the company. Um, my background is uh, sort of random. I have a degree in, in mechanical engineering, bachelor's and master's. I did a bunch of work on semiconductors and uh, some weird physics. Uh, decided I didn't really want to do that for, for my professional career so I went into robotics for a while. Spent about four years as a robotics engineer and then as uh, sort of running business development for a, a NASA and Department of Defense contractor and then decided I wanted to go off and do something kind of consumer oriented but also clean energy focused and so that's kind of how Energy Hub came about. I started the company with two guys I used to work with uh, at this company. It's a very strange New York, uh, sort of only in New York kind of thing. When I joined the company, uh, this is called Honeybee Robotics, I joined the company in uh, 2003. They were um, similar size to where Energy Hub is now, about 25 or 30 people. Um, they were in a walk-up studio basically upstairs from a fashion boutique in, in Nolita. They had just put something on Mars, uh, or actually I guess it was still in space on its way to Mars, and so it was this kind of bizarre thing where you're like walking down the street and there's a cool little Thai restaurant and then an Italian restaurant and then this boutique and then upstairs there's this company that just put something on Mars. And so um, I'm a big fan of that, that type of complete randomness that happens in New York, and so I really couldn't imagine putting the company anywhere else. Um, and as Frank and I were just talking about, it's great to see that the city, especially uh, the mayor, now really promoting sort of what's happening here in New York because there are awesome companies starting. So, um, so I'm just going to kind of dive right into this. Uh, as I stare at my screen, which gives me the, the preview of the next slide, like the very first thing that comes up is a, is a graph with six lines on it. So I'm just going to apologize for that. So this is going to, I'm going to start off here by just highlighting what is an amazing, amazing sort of missed opportunity for the last several decades, but which has created this huge opportunity for Energy Hub to have an impact. So this is what the, um, the energy use of a house looks like, depending on what month you're in. So this is sort of a 24-hour a, a cycle in a house. Um, the center of the, of the chart is noon. And uh, you can see those, those three green and blue lines at the top. Those are sort of the summer and shoulder months, May, July, and September. And the ones down on the bottom are, uh, are January, November, and March. Um, so you can, it's pretty obvious what's happening here. Um, there's this big peak that's happening in the summer months. And if you look at sort of where that energy is coming from, um, that big blue piece on the top of this layer cake is air conditioning, right? So what's wrong with this picture? This is a typical home. Basically, forget about the, the other stuff because it's more or less constant or it doesn't really move the needle. Overwhelmingly, the majority of the energy being used here is air conditioning. So what's wrong with this picture in a typical uh, American house? Um, and the answer is between uh, right about, does my mouse work? Right about here and let's say right about here, people are at work, most people are at work and uh, it means that they're air conditioning their house either for only their house's benefit or maybe for like their fish's benefit. They're, they're, not, they're not really doing anything with that energy use but, um, but they are in fact using that energy and that energy translates directly into the, the, the bill they get from their electric company. So this is a problem for the homeowner but it turns out it's also a problem for the utility. The, the chart on the left there is showing what the um, uh, what the summer peaking curve looks like on, on, a, on a fairly um, high demand uh, day for the utility. That's the total system load. And you can see on the chart on the right, which is in the winter, you just don't have that peak. Um, you basically have two peaks. Uh, you have one sort of right, uh, my mouse is there. So you have this guy uh, for people waking up in the morning, turning on the lights, brushing their teeth, doing some laundry, then everybody goes to work. And then you have that other peak later in the afternoon. So it turns out this is actually a really big problem for utilities because if you look at that yellow piece at the top of the, the peak load at the top of the summer curve, they're building all this infrastructure. The whole electric grid is sized for that because if you look at the, ba the base load down at the bottom, that's what's being used in the middle of the night and then it's just a few really hot days in the summer that create all this additional load on the grid. 
So it creates, it creates problems for both uh, utilities and consumers. Um, and it's amazing how big of a deal this is. And this is about 50% of your bill is going to heating and cooling. Um, and what's, what's shocking is that this problem is being created by a really, really failed piece of technology, which is the thermostat. Roughly 90% of thermostats are either not programmed at all or they're programmed wrong. And so that's sort of where Energy Hub comes in. So how do we get here? If you look back to the um, sort of the good old days of thermostats, you know, these things were super ugly. Uh, the, the iconic uh, Honeywell design on the left is, is kind of more interesting now, but you know, in the 70s and 80s, people were kind of sick of looking at that. Um, and then that, that wonderful piece of technology on the right, which has these little slidey bars. I mean, it's, it's, it's horrible looking, but it has one advantage. They each have a clear off switch. The, with the rotary one, you just kind of turn it all the way down or all the way up, depending on what season you're in, and people fundamentally understand, like, I'm leaving the house, I'm just going to do, I'm going to turn that down. Um, the one on the right, there's actually a little off switch, right? So people got that. But beginning in the 80s, uh, microelectronics were starting to get popular, and, the, um, and people said, okay, let's throw some let's throw some smarts at this and we'll start automating this because right now you know you have to adjust it on on your own a couple times per day if you want to if you want to save energy so let's automate it and unfortunately their first efforts at that were not very successful they uh, you know you come up with these things where there's a knob on the left and then there's two push buttons in the middle and then you've got these little sliders on the right and then I have no idea what that like little light switch thing does but it's uh, I mean this is a really really failed design and everyone hated these, and it was obvious, right? So people thought, OK, um, we're going to take that terrible thermostat, and we're just going to come up with some good new standards for it. The government's going to step in. It's going to be Energy Star uh, time. And we're going to come up with something much better. And so devices, thermostats start coming out in the 90s that are much better looking, and they're theoretically much easier to use. And people say, OK, you know, now we've kind of licked this problem, except the Energy Star spec required that every thermostat had to have this hold button. Turns out that hold button is a huge, huge disaster. Because what happens is, you might set th this up yourself, but chances are you didn't actually buy this. Chances are you upgraded your air conditioning, you bought a new furnace or something, and your HVAC guy came to your house, installed it, and said, hey, I need to put in a new thermostat. And you just put it on the wall. Maybe he program programmed it for you. And the first time you went in to tweak something, it was like, I don't know how this thing works. You know what? I'm a little cold right now. I'm just going to bump it up, and now I'm just going to hit that hold button. And just by doing that, that hold button created this entire problem. Because what happens is instead of this thing automatically changing the temperature. So let's say it's the middle of January. If you keep it nice and toasty, 70, 72 degrees in the morning, you go to work, it drops to, say, 65 degrees. You come home, it comes back up. You go to sleep, it goes back down. Instead of that happening, it's just 72 degrees all the time, which means, again, you're heating or cooling your house even when it's empty. And that created a huge problem. So um, some folks from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab did a bunch of research, and they discovered that w once they went into people's homes that more than 50% of thermostats in the field are, uh, um, are on hold. Um, there are plenty of other problems. You know, most thermostats, even if they were programmed, the time was set wrong. And so the, the, the program was all out of whack, and people got frustrated about it. Um, and the, the bottom line for, con for consumers is that they're saving, or the, I'm sorry, that they're wasting hundreds of dollars a year. So um, they tried to sort of quantify where does this problem exist and how do we fix it. They looked at a bunch of different thermostats um, ranging from uh, this really slick $400 plus dollar touchscreen thermostat on the lower left, a web interface for controlling a thermostat, uh, and then a variety of sort of button through basic touchscreen type models. And they quantified that. So here are, um, you know, the higher bars means that some task took longer. Uh, and the thing that I'll highlight for you is that basically the $400 touchscreen thermostat did pretty terribly, actually. The, um, the time it took to do some of these tasks, and some of those tasks were like go in and change the Thursday morning wake up time from 8 a.m. to 7 a.m., something like that. The touchscreen thermostat actually was terrible, um, but really they were all terrible, and the only thing that was any good was the web, right? I mean, this isn't really all that surprising, but 
even for, for our company, this happened, this was within the last year, this was published, even for us, and we'd spent so much time studying this, this really drove it home, how important it is to do it on, um, a, 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 on a, a computing platform or user interface experience that is fundamentally different from this little screen that's on your wall. And I say this, by the way, having been running a company that made a little screen that went on your wall. I mean, we realized this was, this, even what we were doing was not that great. So we kind of switched gears on that. So it kind of bring, brings up this question, like, why, okay, this has been going on for 25 years, and, you know, surely everybody knew, why hasn't anyone fixed this? Well, it turns out that, you know, there are a ton of these things, but they're stranded in people's homes, and they're, they're not sending any data. So, in fact, people did not know this. For, for at least 10 years, uh, utilities in many areas would actually give you a free thermo programmable thermostat. Or if you went to Home Depot and bought one and sent them the receipt, they would send you a, a rebate check for that, for that same amount of money. And the reason was that they had a computer or they had a simulation or a spreadsheet or something that said that you must be saving money because you have one of these things. And it, it, it took people actually going into hundreds of homes and surveying them uh, to realize that they were actually not getting, they were not being used properly. So um, there were some early attempts at, at making this work. Um, th this, this company uh, called Prolifix came out with one of the first, you know, true networked thermostats. Uh, unfortunately, it was over $600. Um, it also is pretty horrible uh, in, in the way it looks. Um, and yeah, it's networked, but it was Ethernet, so you had to run an Ethernet cord to the thing. So that, that wasn't really going to solve the problem. But the, um, you know, the, sort of the potential was clear. There were just a bunch of things kind of getting in the way. So, uh, this is kind of where, where we come in more present day. Uh, we established that there are really two crucial things. Number one, just get people to program their thermostat and run it on a schedule. That's the number one thing. And then once they've done that, over time, help them make better and better choices. But there are a couple of things that had to happen um, before we could really make this happen, before we could really sort of realize this vision. This is probably one of the most important ones, right? This is a Wi-Fi thermostat sold by 3M at Home Depot for $99. Um, they sell so many of these things. And it's just amazing as you watch 600 turn to 400, turn to 300, 200, and then get under 100 bucks. It just absolutely took off. And then, of course, you know, a couple of other pieces of technology came along, and, and they had a, a pretty big... Um, uh, role to play in this. So we looked at that ecosystem that had developed and we said, you know what, there's kind of a huge opportunity here and we came out with this, uh, this new software platform called Mercury. Um, and there's sort of a, um, you know, there's a, there's a history with Mercury and thermostats and uh, we said, hey, we're going we're gonna to bring it back in virtual form uh, where it's going to help instead of hurt. And, uh, and, and so this is what we've got. So the, basic, the basics of the platform are, are pretty obvious. We can take any wireless communicating thermostat. We don't care what language, protocol, network it talks. Um, we hook it up to our cloud, and, um, uh, and you can then access it on the uh, consumer side from the web and from your smartphone, and then from there's sort of an enterprise side that I'll, co that I'll come to later. Um, and we said, okay, this is going to be you know, this is sort of the foundation, and then we did a, a ton of psychology, user experience design, et cetera, to come up with something that would be really good. And some of the findings were surprising. So we found that one of the most effective, way of get, effective ways of getting people to make the best choices when they're programming is not to actually have them program this at all. You don't ask them what temperature. We just ask people, you know, what, what's your comfort preference? Do you want to be like a standard person or do you want to be a high efficiency person? Do you want to be a super efficient person? And nobody picks low efficiency, right? Nobody does that. And each of these is essentially just correlated to a temperature. But because we've deliberately shifted this, there's a little bit of a guilt factor as you go through and do the initial setting, coupled with this sort of arrow showing how much more you can save using the, the higher efficiency settings. And you see customers making the right choice at the initial setup. But then what was interesting is, OK, so they've done that. They set it up. When the rubber meets the road, you know, if someone's cold, they're still going to say, hey, I'm cold. I want to turn up the heat. Or, hey, I'm hot. I'm going to turn down the air conditioning. And so one of the things we do is you know, when you go to change your, uh, the temperature on your, on your iPhone or on the web, as you're making that decision, so as you're making that sort of fateful decision to go from 
uh, 70 degrees of air conditioning down to 68, we actually show you in real time, hey, if you're going to make this little change, here's how much more it's going to cost you. And this is the time when you give people that information because they're in the process of making that change. And so um, this has been another one that's been really successful. Um, the, the previous two are sort of when the user is engaged, but what about the rest of the time? What about when you're not thinking about your thermostat? What if you have gone in and ignored everything that we've told you as a way to get you to save and we've, uh, and, and, uh, and, and you've sort of slipped in the wrong direction, well, we can hit you with an email that basically says, you know, here's where you are, this is the temperature you're using, and here's where other homes are who are just like you, and this gives people additional context and a little bit of peer pressure, and, uh, and it, it sort of nudges people back in the right direction. We've done a couple of other sort of small things here, like there's this change it now button at the bottom. And so instead of just giving people a piece of advice and relying on them to go log into the site, pull out their phone and do it, they can basically just get the email, click the button, and it, it happens for them. Okay, so that's fine. This is the technology and, and sort of the tip of the iceberg on the user experience. But getting it into people's hands is actually um, a pretty uh, non-trivial thing. If you look at the way most thermostats are sold, you know, they're sold through a, a number of distribution steps. Some manufacturer sells it to a distributor. The distributor sells it to a little mom and pop shop. You've got, you know, B&D Plumbing on Court Street in Brooklyn or whatever it is. And then th that technician might install it in someone's home. It's very, very, very fragmented. And you can imagine even if the, um, even if the, the technology becomes wireless through these, people are not really going to be buying a thermostat and then... Uh, and then picking the software to go with it. They want to buy something that comes with that. Flip side of that is that Energy Hub is a software company and we have no interest in making thermostats. So we made a decision to, to take this sort of channel sales model. And so what we do is we partner with people who are already going to be, who already have a relationship with the customer or are already putting something in front of the customer. So for example, we've partnered with uh, 3M and their supplier to, um, uh, to, to do essentially a completely white labeled version of our software. You can kind of see down at the bottom, there's a little Powered by Energy Hub logo down here. Um, but everything else about it looks like it's a 3M product. So um, we're using their brand, their relationships, et cetera. That's great. We have their access to Home Depot and all the other stores. Um, we partner with utilities sometimes. So this one on the right is showing XL Energy in Colorado. And then um, we also partner with uh, with certain cable companies and, and telcos. These guys have an existing uh, subscription relationship with customers. Um, so this one will be announced soon. I blurred out the logo, but um, there's another big uh, one of these, uh, one of these um, cable companies who's rolling this out. So um, the advantage of this strategy is that we get access through just the cable companies, through probably 40 or 50 million subscribers in the US, through the utilities, all the rest, and then for people who don't want to go buy something through their utility, we're selling through the device manufacturers who are, uh, who are putting this stuff available at retail and through whatever distribution they've got. So um, the net of this strategy is that we get a lot of thermostats coming to, on, onto our software platform, and that means some pretty, uh, some pretty interesting numbers. We are at about 100,000 um, mercury-powered thermostats sold so far, and Every 100,000 of those thermostats is generating about 1.7 billion check-ins, meaning the heartbeat of the device, sort of just letting us know in the cloud that there's something there. About 1.1 billion temperature readings, about 895 million relay logs, 80 million runtime logs, and it, which all adds up to about 5.3 billion data points per 100,000 thermostats per month. Right? So it's a massive, massive amount of data coming in. Um, and it takes some pretty serious infrastructure to, to run this. So we're, of course, running everything on Amazon Web Services in the cloud. Um, the, uh, the, the software people put this diagram together, which I think says that we have a series of boxes that are connected with pieces of string, and uh, we, that, that somehow handles all this. So um, basically what you're looking at is on the left, you've got the... Um, You've got the clients, both the sort of user interface, touch points, web and mobile. On the lower left, you've got the thermostats themselves. Um, those are all connecting to this big load balancer in the cloud. The load balancer dispatches things to a bunch of uh, Tomcat servers. 
that are running on, on AWS. And then those, in turn, distribute data to, to two different databases. One is a huge MongoDB uh, instance that's running multiple shards. Um, uh, it's kind of amazing what you can do with that, but that's basically all of the that's all of the, the, the bulk data. And then on that piece on the lower right, we're handling, for basically for legacy reasons, we're handling all of the user authentication and just user data in a MySQL database down below. Um, it, is, uh, it is amazing what you can do with virtualization in a situation like this. I mean, we can, I watched last week as we hit a particular scale point where for whatever reason, the file system running on the server was, was starting to, to degrade the performance. One of the developers brought up a new uh, Tomcat server, but running a different file system, added it to the Mongo um, set, mirrored all the data onto it in about 15 minutes, and it just basically sat there until the, um, until the other servers that were running that, that were holding these, uh, these, these database instances, hit some sort of critical error and crashed, and the whole thing failed over to the, to the new instance running the new file system and has scaled beautifully since then. Um, and to have that happen without any hardware in our office, not a single professional DBA, not a single professional IT uh, uh, person on staff is amazing. So this is, this is really cool stuff. Um, so this, you know, everything I've showed you so far is essentially why this is useful to consumers. Um, the sort of the net of this from what we've seen so far is that people are typically saving about 20 to 30 percent on their, on their heating and air conditioning bills, which translates to, for the average user, something on the order of 200 to $300 per year. But um, it turns out this is also really useful for, uh, for utilities. So if you think back to that, that chart I showed you earlier, this is what the sort of the load curve looks like in a, typ a typical utility. There is this, um, this base load. This is essentially the power that is being used all the time, and you really rarely drop into the base load. There's always a little bit of intermediate load happening. That's coal or nuclear. Above that is this intermediate cycling and then eventually, and eventually the peak load. That is almost always a natural gas peaker plant. Um, sometimes they will add diesel generators, which are incredibly expensive and incredibly dirty. So this is what sort of a peak curve looks like. Um, the thing is, over time, populations increase or they move around, people buy more flat screens, the total amount of power being used is going up steadily. And at some point, you just don't have any more supply, and you have to build more supply. If you want to build more supply, that usually means either bringing more capacity online in the, in the, on the generation side or building additional transmission and distribution. You know, where I live in, in Park Slope, uh, there is a load pocket, and Con Ed is kind of running up against this place where when on a really, really hot day, they basically beg people to turn their air conditioning down, right? And they, you, know, they, you see stuff in the New York Post and New York Times saying like, hey, turn your stuff down today because we're going to have blackouts. If they want to upgrade that transmission capacity, they would have to rip up streets for miles to lay additional cable, right? So it turns out that is really expensive. That's not, that's not surprising. But there's a much cheaper way to do that, which is actually instead of adding supply, you can manage the demand side and actually reduce capacity. And so that's what something like that little dip in the peak load curve looks like. Um, every 100,000 homes, on average, is worth probably about 100 megawatts of total peak load, meaning at 3 p.m. on a Thursday afternoon in August, 100,000 homes are pulling about 400 megawatts of load. Um, we can shave about a quarter of that by reaching into someone's home and reducing their air conditioning by just a little bit without really anyone noticing. Uh, um, there is a, a very good precedent of utilities doing this. People get paid. Um, this isn't sort of something that happens in secret. People sign up for the program. They tend to get paid very well for participating in this because it's so much cheaper. And it's pretty shocking. You know, even the number of customers that we've got now is worth about take, just about taking this entire power plant offline, right? This, this Far Rockaway power station, which is about 109 megawatts. So you can take an entire one of those offline with a tiny fraction of the New York City population just by tweaking people's air conditioning by maybe two degrees or four degrees. Um, it's an amazing impact. And when you do that, this is the kind of thing that, uh, that happens. So um, what you're seeing here is uh, the, the black line or blue line. That's sort of a normal peak day. Um, when you call a demand response event, 
that, that, that peak growth just basically stops at some point, maybe dips or maybe just flat lines, and then eventually the peak either smooths out or you move it later in the day so that uh, it's no longer coincident with other loads. And it makes an enormous, enormous difference. This saves utilities a huge amount of money, which again actually saves uh, the ratepayers money because ultimately we pay for all this stuff through our utilities. Um, this is not a theoretical thing. This is actually not a new thing. There are about seven million homes that are enrolled in programs like this today. Um, but they suffer from pretty significant recruiting issues, trying to get as many people onto one of these programs as you need. Um, there's significant customer churn. Customers are not necessarily incentivized properly to stay into these. So imagine that you're a utility, you've got a million customers who are running one of these programs. If you had 7% churn, which would be typical for some of the companies in this space, it means you have to sign up 70,000 new homes every year to stay, to stay above water. Um, and ultimately, those recruiting issues and those churn issues come down to the fact that there hasn't been something really useful for the consumer. And so the, the innovation we bring in the utility market is that we're selling something that, that, uh, that utilities get huge value out of, but that their customers also get va value out of. So they get 365 days of energy saving in exchange, and they probably also get paid by the utility. They probably get a free thermostat, professionally installed for free, and they get something that saves them money all year. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty uh, good selling point for users. So you know, what's the impact of this if we were to be really huge? So we sort of ran the numbers I talked about before, a 20% reduction in heating and cooling usage. Um, we, spell, we spend about $22 billion a year on central AC in the US and about $49 billion a year on heating. So if we save 20% on those, we would save about $8 billion a year, about 32 and a half terawatts, ter uh, sorry, terawatt hours uh, per year of electricity, and about 440 billion cubic feet of, of natural gas, in addition to the over a billion gallons of fuel oil and, and um, liquid propane. So absolutely, absolutely enormous what you can do simply by essentially rolling the, cl the clock back about two decades and fixing this problem that originated with these, uh, these thermostats that people came out with in the 80s. Mm -hmm.